That's what, that was back in 1948. I'm sorry, I know that has your mother. <laughs> Our little kid's stupid. Does anybody remember that? Do you? It's Sunday morning, and we are in a study uh, on prophecy. Most people have no idea what prophecy is about. Prophecy is about everything in the Bible from one end to the other. Now, what we're doing is we're teaching on prophecy. It's about Israel. And Israel is a family line. It starts over here in Genesis, the fifth chapter, and it starts with Adam. Goes down to Noah, and Noah is the great, 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 great name ten times, ten greats, and he's that many great grandson of Adam. And then you go down, and you go on down to uh, in that eleventh chapter of Genesis eleven, and you count again down to the. You start with Adam, and you count another ten, and you get to Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. And these are father, son, and son. And Jacob's name is changed to Israel. And I put this on the board so many times. This is what's called a timeline. There's only one timeline in the Bible. There's no other. Everything in the Bible is about this timeline here. This is a family. The Bible is about a family, one family. It's God's family. It's Israel. Starts with Adam. And then goes all the way down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then, of course, Jacob's got 12 sons, and that becomes the 12 tribes of Israel. His 11th son, Joseph, is sold into bondage over there in Egypt in the 37th chapter of Genesis, and then they are in Egypt for 400 years. And then Moses comes along. God calls him in, in the uh, second chapter of, actually, third chapter of Genesis. He comes along in the second chapter, excuse me, Exodus, comes along and Moses delivers them out of Egypt they're in Egypt 400 years and then they go uh, into the wilderness for 440 years excuse me then they get back to the land that was given to Abraham that was a covenant given to Abraham in Genesis the 17th chapter and he received the land of Israel God said the land is mine it can't be sold and it goes to Abraham then it goes to Isaac his son then Jacob, his son, and then these 12 sons received that land. Well, after 400 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, they come back to this land that was given to Abraham. And then they're back into, the, back into uh, Canaan. It's not called Israel yet. And there for about 300 years, they're under the rule of judges. Judges. And there's some very famous judges, uh, people like Ehud, he was a left-handed man, and people like uh, Deborah, a woman. They didn't, believe, they didn't believe they should be judged by a woman, and God says, just for that, I'll give you one. And they didn't like left-handed people. They thought they were evil. Is anybody left-handed here? Oops, a lot of people. So they thought they were evil, so God says, I'll give you a left-handed man. His name is Ehud, and he'll deliver you. So God always gave them what they didn't think was good for them, and then after all these years under Judges and Samson and Gideon and, and some of these other guys, they become a nation in 1 Samuel and through Second Chronicles. And everything in the Bible that happens with Israel is concerning what happens during this time period right here. This is the time period that they're a nation or a kingdom under kings under kings oops under kings and the first king the first king was god the bible says god was your king when you desired a king they said give us a king in the eighth chapter of first samuel god picks out saul as the first man king now saul god picks him out of the tribe of benjamin but According to that 49th chapter of Genesis, the king has to come out of Judah. Judah is the fourth son 
of Jacob, and Benjamin is the twelfth son of Jacob. So he's out of the wrong tribe. So God has got to see to it that Saul uh, does all the sinning that he's going to do so God can turn away from him. When the Bible says he repented God that he made Saul king over Israel, God didn't repent in the sense that he found a church, a Baptist church, and went walking down the aisle and said, I'm just so sorry I made Saul so king. <laughs> no, that's not how he repented. He turned from making Saul king, and that's what that word repent means. He turned, but he had to plan that turn because he picked out Saul out of the wrong tribe, and he did it on purpose because the people were saying, we want a king. And Samuel said, God is your king. Why do you need a, a man king? So all the time they have kings, Saul turns away from God. He's a goodly man when he comes. There's not a goodlier man in all of Israel. He was the tallest man in Israel. I don't know how tall he was. They weren't as tall as they are today, but he was tall by their standards. So all through these books here, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Let me point out to you again, First and Second Samuel and First Chronicles, these First and Second Samuel and First Chronicles are parallel stories. These are the stories. First and Second Samuel is about Saul and David, and you end the book of first of of Second Samuel when David is an old man, and you get into First Kings. And that's where Solomon becomes king. And that's the David, is the, David is the first legitimate king. Saul's the first man king. And then you got Solomon. And then the kingdom splits. Then the kingdom splits into two kingdoms because Solomon allows his 700 wives and 300 concubines to go after their gods, Baal, Grove, Shemosh, Molech, Ashtaroth, the gods of the Zidonians. And he's married to all these women, so he allows them to have their gods. So God says, because you do that, I'm going to split the kingdom. You have northern Israel, and you have southern Israel. Southern Israel. And southern Israel is called Judah. Now, southern Israel is comprised of the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin tribe of Benjamin. Well, northern Israel is headed up by Joseph. Is headed up by Joseph. Joseph. And his tribe was his tribe was divided into Ephraim. And that was the second born of Joseph and Manasseh. And Ephraim received the inheritance of northern Israel in Genesis the 48th chapter. He gets the inheritance. So anytime you find northern Israel referred to, anytime you find any part of Israel referred to as Ephraim, Ephraim, after, long after their death, that's talking about northern Israel. Or if you hear the word Samaria, that's talking about northern Israel. Uh, or if, it, if the Bible speaks of Israel after the split, it's talking about northern Israel. It's not talking about southern Judah. Judah is, southern Judah, these two tribes together, God took the name of Judah because out of Judah would come the king and the king and in southern Israel is, is, the, is Jerusalem uh, and that's where the temple sits. So that's in southern Judah. Now, we're looking at Israel going after all these gods, and God says when Moses comes out of, brings them out of Egypt after 400 years, God keeps saying, when I started reading the Bible, I was 17, something like 17, in about 1956, I didn't know where to go and what to read, so I just started reading through the Bible, just reading one thing after another. And I kept noticing that God kept saying, I'll send famine, pestilence, pestilence if you're disobedient to me then he would say i would send sword famine pestilence and he would say that over and over and then i got over to ezekiel the 14th chapter and he says i have four sore or four evil 
raw, it's the word evil, four sword judgments, and he said it will be the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the final judgment will be the beast. We studied the beast in Daniel 7 and in Revelation 13, and the beast is Babylon, and then Persia overthrows Babylon, and Persia Mede Empire is overthrown uh, by Alexander the Great's Grecian Empire, and it's called the beast because Babylon is represented as a lion, Persia is represented as a bear. Now, sometimes Persia is represented. They have other representations, but wing being referred to as the beast, we see uh, Persia is referred to as a bear in the seventh chapter of Daniel, but in the eighth chapter of Daniel, uh, Persia is referred to as a goat with two horns, a two-horned goat, and one is longer and stronger than the other. That's because Persia was stronger than the Medes. So they have different representations. I've had people say, well, if we're the church, we're always referred to as, uh, as feminine gender. Well, no, not necessarily. We're also referred to as the flock, referred to as the wife, referred to as the church, we're referred to as the bread, we're referred to as the temple, we're referred, we're referred to as many things. So then uh, Greece is represented as a leopard, and there's reasons for all this that I won't go into. Now, I always like to say the reason Persia was rep represented as a bear because the bear is the largest carnivore upon the face of the earth. And the Persians had the largest armies that ever existed. They attacked Carthage with two and a half million men. And the lion is most regal of all the animals and Babylon is the most regal of all the empires. The leopard is a killing machine. That's what Alexander the Great was with his Grecian Empire. Then, then Rome comes along, and that's the beast with iron teeth, iron teeth, and it will devour all the other empires. And so this system here will be the final judgment that carries Israel away into captivity because they keep going after Baal, Grove, Molech, Shemosh, Shemosh, Ashtaroth, the god of the Zidonians, the god of the Egyptians. And Israel went after all of this, the time period that they were a nation, and they were scattered all over the earth for 2,600 years. Now, what we're doing, they were scattered until they were brought back in something that's called Zionism. There was a Jew living in Paris. His name was Theodore Herzl. Mr. Herzl saw a Jew slaughtered on the streets of Paris, and he said, we've got to do something to have our own homeland. And he started Zionism in 1896. He said, we need a, a way to start our own homeland. He couldn't say, see the Jews liberated uh, from all of this misrule and this slaughter and butchery in 1917, he could not see the Balfour Declaration issued as a, as a method of, as a foothold for Israel becoming a nation uh, in 1920, and then that, that declaration expires May 14th, uh, 1948, 1948. They become a nation for the first time when they're scattered in 586 B.C., for the first time, 586 B.C., now, prophecy is about all of this. It's about Israel's being scattered and Israel being regathered and coming back. When all of this begins to happen, the Bible says, when this all begins to come to pass, then lift up your head and look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. I believe we're sitting right on the verge of eternity. I believe Christ's coming could be, it's not going to be at any time. It's not imminent in the sense it'll be at any second because I do not believe in a pre-trib rapture. The Bible says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Then 1 Corinthians 15, 51, I uh, show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. There, there are seven trumpets sound in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. And when the last one sounds, the mystery of God, which is the church, is finished. The word finished is the word teleos. It means complete. The last one will come in the fold. That's predestination. God's got his family chosen. The last one will come in the fold. When the, la when the seventh trumpet sounds and Christ, Christ puts one foot on the land and the other on the sea and says time is no more and the seventh trumpet will sound. 
We're going to be changed at the last trump. When you look at Matthew, the 24th chapter, and the apostles say there in verse 3, When will these things be, and what will be the sign of thy coming? Thy parousia, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A, your physical arrival. When you're coming back, we want to know when you're coming back to stay with us forever. We don't want you leaving us. And he gives them all these signs. And then he says, he gives them, uh, uh, many will come in my name saying I am Christ. They'll deceive many. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation. By the way, that word nation is the word ethnos. If we get our word ethnic from that. It means Gentiles or non-Jews will rise against one another. And he says, all these signs will come, the abominations of desolation. And he says, you're wanting to know the sign of my coming. If anyone says, lo, here or there, don't you believe it? If they say he's in the desert, go not forth. If they say he's in the secret chamber, don't you believe it? If they say he's in a Mormon chamber out in, in uh, Nevada, don't believe that. If the Jehovah's Witnesses say he's in the desert... In 1914, they go out there and climb up on some high mountain and wait for the Lord to come. Don't believe that because he says, the next time the world sees me, it will be as the lightning shines from the east to the west there in verse 28 of chapter 24 of Matthew. And then he says in verse 29, after the tribulation of those days, that's the time factor. He says, after the tribulation of those days, uh, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give her light and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. After the tribulation, he's going to send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and the last one hasn't sounded yet. Well, no man will know the day nor the hour, but we can know the season and the way we're going to know the season is by the things that are going up on upon the earth. God says these judgments, there will be no remedy for these judgments. He says at the end of time, There'll be distress of nations with perplexity. In Luke 21, 25, he says, The sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing in for fear for looking after the things coming on the earth. So he says, There'll be distress of nations with aporia, no answer. And what is it there's no answer for? For the judgments of God, the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast will rise up at the end of time and say, I have the answers. Now we have sword, famine, pestilence. Sword is war. We got wars and rumors of war. We got wars everywhere. The Middle East is one war after the other. They're constantly in a war. We've got wars in the Far East. We've got wars all over the world like we've never had before. We've got pestilence everywhere, diseases of all kinds. And we've got famine. Famine is the economy. That's what's going on. We're in the verge of passing into, the, into eternity. I'm, I'm prepared to go and I trust that God will deal with the believers here and prepare them so they can go out to meet the Lord in the air one day and I and he will prepare his people he will God has an elect family and we're elected to obedience and he'll see to it that we do that now what we're doing is we're talking about what brought all this about everything that's going on in the world in prophecy today is brought about by Israel's actions during this time period that they were a nation from about 1,091 from Saul. That's about when he began to reign. Saul began to reign. I've got, a, I've got a, a chart here of the kings of Israel. And all prophecy, all prophecy in, in the Bible is about what they did, what these guys did while they were kings of Israel. God said, if you're obedient to me and you worship me and keep my laws and my statutes, I will be your God, you'll be my people. And he says, your, your, your wombs will be full, your children will be healthy, your storehouses will be full, there'll be plenty of rain, there'll be plenty of crops, and you'll beat all your enemies, you'll go against them one way, they'll flee seven ways. All of these kings right here, everything that's going on in prophecy is due to what these kings did from the first king Saul down to the last king Zedekiah in 586 B.C. What we're talking about, everything that's going on in the world today in the Middle East is about what's going on in the Bible. In the Bible during this time period right here. That is, the. if you don't understand Israel's history as a nation, you do not understand what's happening in the Middle East in the world because it's directly connected to this. And all of this, this fire and tree worship they were involved in is the same thing as Christ's Mass. It's the same thing that Constantine brought in the church and renamed Christ's Mass in 325 A.D. So everything that's going on is about Christmas. The 
World Trade Center coming down is, is because Israel celebrated that system under another, another name in the ancient world. Now, what I'm going to do, I want to show you where Israel was scattered. They were scattered in 586. That's the last scattering, 586 B.C. That was southern Judah. Southern Judah was scattered 586. Northern Israel was scattered in 722. But they were under siege for 10 years from 732, 732 until uh, 722. There were these Assyrian kings which were... Now Assyria is considered to be biblically northern Babylon. Babylon did overthrow Assyria, but they carried northern Israel and there were, there were three particular kings in 2 Kings and in 2 Chronicles that came in to slaughter Israel. You had, you had Tiglath-Pileser. Tiglath, I always like that word. P-I-L-E-S-E-R. Or that's what he's called in 2 Kings. In 2 Chronicles, he's called Tilgath, T-I-L-G-A-T-H, Pilneser, Pilneser. And then you had a, a man that came after him. They were attacking northern Israel for 10 years. And then you had Shalmaneser. Now some people, I've looked at Shalmaneser many times, Shalmaneser. And some think he was Sennacherib, S-C-H-E, or S-E-N-N, Sennacherib. Yeah. Sennacherib. I'm not getting this right. Sennac. Something like that. Sennacherib. He was... He was the man that finally carried Israel away, northern Israel captive in 722. It was Nebuchadnezzar. The king of Babylon that carried southern Judah away in 586. Northern Israel had three deportations. Southern Judah had three deportations. And two of them were peaceful in, five, in 605 B.C. and in 597 B.C. And then in 586 was the slaughter of Israel. And then they were captive until May 14th. They were under many, many different nations and monarchs until May 14th, 1948. And then, of course, uh, you have the four major wars, major wars that have gone on so, so far. And Israel has been fighting these wars even before May of 1948. Now, I am not a historian. I teach biblical. I am a Bible teacher. I'm not a historian. I don't claim to be that, but I will teach I will give you some high points of these wars to show that they are the miraculous movement of God in the Middle East upon Israel. It has been nothing but a miracle for the things to happen that have happened. What I'm trying to do is show you the Bible. I want you to know how these things in the Middle East, how they show the veracity or the honesty and the truthfulness of Scripture. That's what I want you to know. We're not going to go into all the various happenings in the Middle East. We're not here to learn. If I had time to learn the history, I'd do that. I just don't have time to do all of it. So what I want you to see, I want you to see what's going on in the world. But first of all, I want you to see why Israel was scattered while they were a nation under kings. Now, I've given you, we've, we've gotten down through the 18th chapter of 1 Kings. That is where... That is where Ahab, the king of northern Israel, marries Jezebel. Uh, here, if this is Israel right here, right above Israel is what we call Lebanon. That is the old ancient land. That is the old ancient land of Tyre 
in Sidon or Phoenicia. Boy, that's kind of skinny, isn't it? This is the old ancient. This is Tyre and Sidon up here. Or we call it Lebanon. It's the old ancient land of Phoenicia. Or, more ancient than that, Tyre, Sidon. And of course, the king of Sidon, his daughter was Jezebel. If you'll notice on the end of their names, he was the prince of Tyre and he was called Ethbaal. Ethbaal means with Baal, their god. With Baal. Well, she marries Ahab, king of northern Israel, there in the 16th chapter of 1 Kings, and brings her gods down here. And you have northern Israel, southern Judah, and they make Baal in the grove. They build temples for Baal and temples for the grove. The grove is the tree goddess is the tree goddess, and they build temples for them here in northern Israel. That actually makes Israel a Christmas nation, a Roman Catholic government. Later on it's called Roman Catholicism, but it's Baal and Grove back here. Christmas brought into the church in 325, uh, 325 A.D. by Constantine with the same system that Israel went after here. So, in 1 Kings 16, it's brought down here. We went through this and how that in the 17th, in the 18th chapter, 17th chapter of 1 Kings, Elijah comes on the scene. Now, we don't know what he was. Nobody knows. We know he was a Tishbite, but nobody is sure what a Tishbite is. It might be an Arab. Uh, could have been any number of things. We know that he was fed by the ravens after he told Ahab there'll be no rain in Israel for three and a half years. Goodbye, I'm out of here. He left. And then after people started dying by the hundreds of thousands, Jezebel takes off. She's going to get Elijah and kill him. Of course, Elijah, uh, there in the 18th chapter, he faces off with Ahab. Ahab, and he says, let's let the God that answers by fire, let's let him be God. Of course, Baal was said to be the fire god, and fire represented the sun upon the earth. This was the sun gods of the ancient world. The sun god in among the, the Romans was, they had dozens of them in every society. That would be Jupiter and Hercules, and uh, depending on what nation you're in, Zoroaster, Tammuz, uh, the female deities were the tree goddesses, Aphrodite, Diana, and so forth, and it goes on and on or Venus, the grove was the same thing. So in the night, so in that 18th chapter, they face off, and Elijah prays to God, and he licks up the sacrifice and the fire. That's after, that's after 450 prophets of Baal, the fire god, and these were prophets of Jezebel, of Jezebel, after they jump up and down on the altar all day long, cutting themselves, bleeding, and Elijah makes fun of him and laughs at him and says, Perhaps your God is asleep. Maybe your God is on a journey. You need to yell louder. After all, he is a God, isn't he? Well, God licks up the fire in the altar and Elijah gives the order, go and kill all these priests of Baal. And of course, the children of Israel go and kill all these 450 priests of Baal. And then God says, Elijah, go look towards the west and you'll see a little cloud coming up. And he says, I hear the sound of abundance of rain after three and a half years. Three and a half years of no rain. Can you imagine three and a half years, not one drop falls from the sky? Could you imagine what happened to America? We'd have half of most of us be dead, wouldn't we? So then you get into that 19th chapter, and God says, and Elijah is running from Jezebel, and he says, I am tired, I am fed up. Boy, it's the way I feel sometimes. And he, went, he was running from Jezebel. He takes off. He's up here at Mount Carmel in northern Israel. Mount Carmel. And he starts running for his life. This is Elijah. And he runs the length of Israel. 
goes all the way down here into the Negev desert. He finds him a juniper tree. He says, God, I, that woman's wanting to kill me. And what is all this? This is all useless. What am I doing all this for? I'm tired. I'm through. I quit. You ever felt like that? I have. I think I've felt like that this past week. I just give up. God, God says, I'll tell you when you're going to give up. I got some other things for you to do. Don't tell me you're going to quit. I'm not through yet. Get on down there. Get on down there to Sinai or Horeb. And I've got a message for you. And he goes down there. And there's a great wind comes. Just a great like a hurricane comes. God says, I'm not in that. And he hears the earthquake. God says, that's not what I brought you down here to talk to you about. And God brings a great flame and a great fire. And he said, that's not it either. There was a still, small voice. God says, here's what I brought you to do. And let's look at that still, small voice, what he told him there in the 19th chapter of First King, uh, Second Kings. Excuse me. First Kings, 19th chapter of First Kings. He says, here's what I want you to do. And Elijah is feeling sorry for himself. Uh, have you ever done that as a believer? He says, I'm the only one left to serve you, God. Nobody believes you but me and poor me and woe is me. And God says, get up from there and get down there to Sinai. Here's what I want you to do. In verse 14, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Well, God tells him later, he says there's 7,000 in Israel that have not bowed the knee to Baal. And the Lord said unto him, Go return on the way to the wilderness of Damascus. When thou comest, I need you to anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. H-A-Z-A-E-L. Now, what Hazael is going to do, he's going to be a switch in God's hand to beat Israel with because of their apostasy. And he's going to bring this Syrian king. Hazael is going to follow Ben-Hadad. In fact, he's going to smother Ben-Hadad up on his deathbed. And he's going to be a punishing rod in God's hand to strike Israel to the ground. Then he says, I need you to go and anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Now we're going to be studying Hazael when we get over into Second Kings and we get into Second Chronicles. We'll be talking about him later on. He's got a long story. And I want you to, and Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. I need Jehu there because Jehu is a Jezebel killer. I need him and I want him to kill Jezebel and I want to kill him to kill all the sons of Ahab and we're going to rid the world of this family. And I want him to kill 70 sons of Ahab. We'll get into that when we get into the 10th chapter of 2 Kings. We don't have time to go there right now. Now, and he says, And Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou not to be king, and you think your work is done? I have got a man named Elisha that you've got to anoint. He's got to take your place. Your work wasn't done yet. And Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Melhola, thou shalt anoint to be prophet in your place. Right prior to this, up here in the first part of the chapter, he says, I'm through, I quit, I'm sitting down under this juniper tree, I'm fed up. Jeremiah said at one point, I believe it's in that 17th chapter of Jeremiah, he said, Lord, you deceived me. You didn't tell me this is going to be this hard, telling people that Christmas is pagan and Easter is pagan and predestination is true and God doesn't love everybody. You didn't tell me that 
I was going to have this heart attack. I quit. But I can't quit. It's in my heart. It's burning inside. I can't. But I want to. Wanting to quit and quitting are two different things. We've all wanted to. But we can't. Can we? Uh, it gets hard sometimes, doesn't it? When we must too much tribulation into the kingdom of God, I want to quit sometimes. But I can't. Now, I want us to continue in our study. We, we kind of wrap up this. God has to send Jehu to kill the 70 sons of Ahab. And he sends eight Jehu to kill Jezebel over in that ninth chapter of 2 Kings. He's going to get them too. I love Jehu. Uh, I loved him, but he kind of dropped the ball. He was kind of like, Jehu was like Jehoshaphat and Asa. He was a righteous king, but he was, he got a little off along the way. He didn't get rid of the golden calf worship. The golden calf worship was, was more or less a title deed to northern Israel. When Jeroboam was going to, when Rehoboam was going to attack Jeroboam, an, a messenger, Shemai, came, comes to Rehoboam and says, don't do this. This is of God. I've split this kingdom. And Jeroboam says, now that Rehoboam is not going to attack us, all the people will go back and join southern Judah. So I've got to do something. So he installs golden calf worship and tells Israel, Behold the God that brought you out of Egypt. He doesn't actually say golden calf, do, do, does it? He just reduces Jehovah to a golden calf. So the golden calf, most of these north kings of northern Israel, they kept golden calf worship. It was like a title to northern Israel. Once they do away with that, there's no reason for Israel to stay separated from southern Judah. So they, most of them will get rid of Baal in the grove, but they'll keep golden calf because they want the throne. That's why it was like having a having golden calf was like, okay, we're passing it on the golden calf to you, and now you're king after me. That was what it was like. Now, I want us to go to 2 Kings. We see that Ahab was killed in the 22nd chapter, 1 Kings. When he goes into battle against Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, now here's Israel, here's Syria up here, right next door to Lebanon, or Tyre and Sidon. It still has the same name, the same basic area, and uh, Israel is down here. Now, in the 22nd chapter, uh, Jehoshaphat, a righteous man is minding his business in southern Judah, and Ahab comes down there and says, will you go fight Ben-Hadad with me? Well, that's why Jehu later on reprimands Jehoshaphat and sa says to him, shall you help the ungodly that has brought Baal in the grove into Israel? And all of this is why Israel was scattered and why they're back today. I, I want to remind you of what I'm getting at once in a while. All of this that's going on was about what's going on in the Middle East today. Now, where I want us to go, I'm going to read to you. We're kind of hitting some high spots and points of where Israel is going after Baal, Grove, Shemash, Molech. Ashtaroth was a, was a generic name for all the female deities. It's an O if it's singular. It's an E, Ashtoreth, if it's plural. Now, I want us to read some of these places as to why God's uh, scattering Israel. Look here in, in uh, 2 Kings, the third chapter. 2 Kings, third chapter. Now, you're getting up into 2 Kings. Remember, in 2 Kings, well, I won't go into that yet. 2 Kings, the third chapter. Now, Verse, let's read here just a little bit in the first few verses. Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab. Jehoram, son of Ahab. Ahab had a son named Ahaziah. He had a son named Jehoram. If you notice, there's a Jehoram 
and then they reside down here in southern Judah. That's because when you run around with somebody, you get to name your kids after each other, don't you? That's what you do. So they ran around together. Jehoshaphat was good. Ahab was bad. And Jehoshaphat gets reprimanded by Jehu and says, what are you doing to help an ungodly man? And he was always going to battle, trying to help him out. So you got Jehoram up here. Ahab's son was Ahaziah. Ahab's son was also Jehoram. So this Ahaziah follows Ahab, and then his other son follows uh, Ahaziah, who's his brother. Down here in southern Judah, Jehoshaphat, son was Jehoram, and Jehoram's son was Ahaziah. So this is father, son, grandson. This is father, son, son. You see that? This is the true lineage here. This is the, tri the lineage of Judah. Northern Israel, if you could just amass an army and overtake everybody, you got to be king. Southern Judah, you had to be of the lineage of Judah. Only one there was it. That was Athaliah, the daughter of Jezebel and Ahab. When her husband Jehoram died, she says, I'm taking the kingdom for myself. So she tries to have all of the seed royal of Israel destroyed. That means all of Jehoram's children by any wife. So none of them could, so none of them could inherit the kingdom. And she missed one and his name was Joash. So whenever Joash is hidden by the high priest, and whenever he gets old enough, he brings him out and says, God save King Joash. And she screams bloody murder. And they, he says, go kill Athaliah. Then they resume the throne again. Now, and she's saying, she's saying you're, you're treacherous against me. You're treasonous. You're destroying my life. When she's the murderer, the murderess. Now, look here in verse 1. Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father Ahab, and like his mother Jezebel, who could do the evil that they did. And he put away the image of Baal that his father made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He held on to the golden calf, because that was the throne of northern Israel. And that's why they did it. And put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Well, how's that for a name, Nebat? Name your kid Nebat. Which made Israel to sin, he departed not therefrom. Now look over here. I'm going through here. Uh, I want us to look over at Second Kings 10. Now this is where Jehu comes up and says, I'm going to stop all this noise in Israel. I have been commissioned uh, to go out and to kill, to destroy all of, the, all of the children of Ahab in Israel. And I have been commissioned to straighten this whole thing out and get rid of all the Baal priests. When you get to chapter 10... Jehu's the hero. He kind of drops the ball later because he holds on to northern Israel by holding on to golden calf worship. They don't want to let that go. That's like title deed, like I said. Verse 1, chapter 10. And Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. And Jehu wrote letters and sent to Samaria unto the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders and to them that brought up Ahab's children, saying, Jezreel is in northern Israel, up there around Mount Carmel. Now as soon as this letter cometh to thee, seeing your master's sons are with you, and there are with you chariots and horses and fenced cities also and armor, look even out of the best and meetest of your master's sons and set him on his father's throne and fight for your master's house. But they were exceedingly afraid and said, Behold, Two kings stood not before him. How shall we stand? And he that was over the house, and he that was over the city, the elders also, and the bringers of the children, sent to Jehu, saying, We are thy servants, and will do all that thou hast bid us. We will not make any king. Do thou that which is good in thine eyes. Then Jehu writes a letter the second time, saying, 
If you be mine, you will hearken unto my voice, take you the heads of the men of your master's sons. Their master was Ahab. And come to me to Jezreel by tomorrow this time. Now the king's sons being 70 or 70 sons of Ahab. Jehu is going to rectify this apostasy and godlessness in Israel until they decide to bring it back. Isn't Israel peculiar about like America? Being 70 persons were with the great men of the city which brought them up. And it came to pass when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons and killed these 70 sons of Ahab, this godless king of northern Israel, and put their heads in a basket. Let me tell you, this is some serious stuff to turn away from God. If you think there's not restitution to be made by God, you're mistaken. And sent him them, sent him them to Jezreel, and it goes on down here. I wish I had time. Look at verse 11. So Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel. Now Ahab has died in the 22nd chapter of 1 Kings when he goes into battle, gets Jeho- Jehoshaphat to go into battle and fight the king of northern Israel. And God causes a certain bowman to draw a bow at adventure. It's an upright bow. It's a righteous bow. The word at adventure is the word tamem. It means upright. There's a bow, bowman that draws a bow at adventure in that 22nd chapter, and that's where Jehoshaphat is going into battle against Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, and he draws a bow and goes like that. Draws an exact amount of pounds on the bow, and it takes off on an arc. God is the one who created calculus. You know, calculus is about is about is about uh, plotting curves. God actually did some calculus there. He's got Ahab in his chariot going across the plain, going at an exact speed. That horse is trotting at an exact speed that God wanted him to go. And God has this bowman over here at the side, pull a bow at a venture, and here these two. Objects are going to meet because it's the sovereign will of God and it goes and strikes Ahab between the horns. How's that for calculus? You're talking about he invented it. So Ahab says, I'm hit. I guess you are. You're dead, bub. And he pulls over to the side and and he goes out there and his blood is... He's dripping off the end of his chariot and the dogs come and lick up the blood of Ahab, this wicked man who had brought Baal in the grove into Israel. And Elijah had prophesied the dogs are going to eat your blood, going to lick your blood up for what you've done. You've killed Naboth, this righteous man. You've brought Baal in the grove into Israel. You're a dead man. And he was. Now we're over here. Not only did he kill did he kill Ahab? He's going to have all his sons killed. Now let's look here. This is all over Baal in the grove. What's happening here in this chapter has to do with what's happening in Israel today. It's all about the same story. Let's read a little more here. In verse 8, or verse 9, It came to pass in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, You be righteous. Behold, I conspired against my master and slew him. But who slew all these? All these 70 sons of Ahab. Know now that there shall fall, that there shall fall upon the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. Nothing's going to fall to the ground and not be fulfilled, Jehu says. For the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. So Jehu slew all that remained in the house of Ahab in Jezreel and all his great men and his kinfolks and his priests until he had left him, none remaining. There is not one drop of blood of Ahab walking upon the face of the earth after Jehu's finished with him. 
And he rose and departed and came to Samaria. And as he was in the shear, at the shearing house in the way, Jehu met with the brethren of Ahaziah, the king of Judah, and said, Who are you? Jehu's meet with Ahaziah, king of Judah. Jehoram, his father, has died. He's going to die too. <clears throat> what verse was I in? Jehu met with his brethren of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and said, Who are ye? And they answered, We are the brethren of Ahaziah, and we go down to salute the children of the king and the children of the queen. And he said, Take them alive. And they took them alive and slew them at the pit of the shearing house. They said, We're going to go see Ahab and Jezebel because we're friends of theirs. And Jehu says, Kill them. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> They're going to wipe out everything, is he? Jehu is no, no pansy. You don't mess with him. In fact, if you read the chapter before, the chapter in chapter 9. He's going after Jezebel to kill her and he's driving like a madman in his chariot in chapter 9. He's driving like a crazy man. And Jezebel is up there at Jezreel in her palace looking out and says, Who is that? It looks like Jehu. He's driving like crazy. It must be him. She sends out a horseman and says, Go find out if that's Jehu. And he goes out and meets Jehu and says, Art thou come in peace? He said, who can come in peace? Well, that witch is up there alive. I'm going to kill her. You better get in behind me. She looks out there and says, he's following Jehu. Go out there, horseman. Get another horseman and have him go out there. He goes out and says, is it peace? He said, there will be no peace until that woman is dead. And he goes up there and he, and he gets up to Jezreel and she's up there looking down and there's some eunuchs up there on the balcony with her, and he says, he says, won't you come down? <laughs> he says, throw that woman off the balcony. And they throw her down, and he just crushes her. And they eat her body, but they won't eat her hands. The dogs eat her body, and they won't eat her hands and feet that have gone to do such wickedness. They say we, the dogs say, we don't want that kind of wickedness. And God does to Jezebel. He destroys her in that ninth chapter. And in this tenth chapter, Jehu's going to see to it because of Baal and the grove. And Jehu's going to get this place clean of Baal and grove and all these other gods except for the golden calf. Now, let's keep reading. I think this is interesting to read. Jehu slew all that remained. And where was I? 14. And he said, Take them alive. And they took them alive and slew them at the pit of the shearing house. Even two and forty-two men, neither left he any of them. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said, Is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart? And Jonadab answered, It is, I'm on your side. If it be, give me thine hand, and give him his hand. And he took him to him into the chariot, and he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride his chariot. And when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria. He's going to cleanse Israel of this godlessness. If you think you can sin and go after other gods of self and get by, you're wrong. You say, well, I hadn't been dealt with yet and God hadn't destroyed America yet. That's the word, yet. Till he had destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord which he had spake to Elijah. Now, starting in verse 18, Jehu says, we're going to get rid of of all the priests in Israel and everybody that has anything. And he does one of, the, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. He gets real sneaky with the priests of Baal. And Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu's going to serve Baal a whole lot. 
Now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal and all his servants and all his priests and let none be left out or wanting. I want all of them here in one spot. I'm going to really serve Baal. He's lying. It's a righteous lie. He wants to get them all in one place because he wants to kill them. They wouldn't come if he said, I'm going to kill all of you when you get here, would he? No. You see, I've said before, there are some lies in the Bible. Some are good lies, some are bad lies. Ahab was just an out-and-out -out liar. He told Elijah, you're the one that's troubling Israel. That's a lie. You're doing it, you fool. For I have great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. But Jehu did it in subtility. He is being sneaky. To the intent that he might destroy the worshipers of Baal. Anybody who's a priest of Baal, a worshiper of Baal, we're going to kill them all. And Jehu said, proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. And Jehu through all Israel and all the worshipers of Baal came so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal. And the house of Baal was full from one end to another. It was packed full of pre Baal priests. And Jehu's going, are they all here yet? Hmm. Be sure they all get in here. And he said unto him that was over the vestry, Bring forth vestments for all the worshippers of Baal. And he brought them forth vestments. And Jehu went, and Jonadab the son of Rechab, into the house of Baal, and said unto the worshippers of Baal, Search and look that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord. I'm not going to kill any of God's servants. He's making them think, We want a pure Baal purity here as we serve Baal. But the worshippers of Baal only, and when they went in to offer sacrifices, burnt offerings, Jehu appointed fourscore men or eighty men outside and said, If any of the men whom I brought into your hands escape, if you let him go, your life will be for the life of him that escapes. Don't you let one of these Baal priests out of this house. And it came to pass as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering that Jehu said to the guard and to the captains, Go in and kill them. It's a way to get them in there, isn't it? And don't let any of them out. And if one of them escapes, whoever lets him escape, you'll die. You see, Jehu, this was a serious thing with God. And it came to pass as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering that Jehu said to the guard and to the captains, Go in and kill him. Let none come forth. And they smote them with the edge of the sword and the guard and the captains cast them out and went to the city of the house of Baal and they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them and they break down the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a draught house unto this day. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. He got rid of Christmas, didn't he? You think if God would do this over the same system of their another name under Bell and Grove worship that was brought into the church and renamed Christmas, and God's having Jehu kill all these people he wants us to do Christmas? I don't think so. Now, huh, let me go ahead and read down a little ways here so you can see something that's about to happen. Howbeit from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not after them to wit the golden calves. Jehu. First time I read about Jehu, I hadn't read this part yet. I was very young. I thought this is like Superman. This is like, this is like the most wonderful man that's come along in Israel. And then I got to this verse and went, oh, it's Jehu. Why did you do this? To wit the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel, northern Israel. 
That's after the split. Whenever you see Israel after the split, it's talking about northern Israel. And that's where Jehu was. Northern, uh, Jehu is northern Israel. This is north. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. Ask me if I understand that. I don't understand it at all, any more than I understand why Solomon allowed his wives, his 700 wives and 300 concubines in the 11th chapter of 1 Kings, to go after all their gods. I don't understand. When I get to heaven, I believe Jehu will be there. I believe, so I know Solomon will be there. I want to ask them, what was going on in your mind? What were you thinking? They'll probably say, I was in my sin. Like the rest of us. If they knew my life, they'd say, why'd you do what you did? I don't know. Just off in sin. And look at verse 32. In those days, the Lord began to cut Israel short, and Hazael smote them in all the coast of Israel. You see, Elijah's work wasn't done until he anointed Hazael to cut Israel down. Hazael was nothing but a sword in the hand of God. David said, Deliver me from the wicked which is thy sword in thy hand. He was a sword to cut Israel to the ground, wasn't he? Now, goodness, we went through Jehu. Whew. The last... Let me show you where God says, I've had my fill of Israel. 2 Kings 21. This is where God says, now we're, we've got to go back and cover 17, 18, and 19 because 17 is about where God carries northern Israel away into captivity. 18 and 19 is where they come down, where the Assyrians come down to southern Judah while they're attacking northern Israel. Some people will say, well, in 722 B.C. when they attacked northern Israel, why didn't they go down and attack southern Judah? They tried to. <laughs> they tried to. But yet southern Judah wasn't corrupt yet. Southern Judah at that time had a king named Hezekiah. And they had a prophet named Isaiah. Now there's a combination you don't want to attack. Because Hezekiah is one of the most righteous kings in Israel. And Isaiah is certainly one of the most righteous prophets ever lived. You don't want to attack in the eyes of God a righteous king and a righteous prophet. And the Sennacherib came down to southern Judah in that 18th chapter and sent his messenger, his Rabshakeh, sent his Rabshakeh over to the wall of Jerusalem and says, aren't you going to surrender? Don't you know the great king of Assyria has come down to conquer you? And Hezekiah got a little nervous. And Israel was just a small little town. Jerusalem was just a small town. And here's the greatest king in the world to come to conquer him. They'd already subdued northern Israel. Carried them off into captivity. They said, while we're here, let's get their cousin down here. And, and Hezekiah went to Isaiah and said, Isaiah, there's this great king outside the walls of the city. What are we going to do? Isaiah said, I'll go talk to the Lord. Just settle down. Isaiah went and had a little prayer with the Lord in that 18th chapter, 2 Kings. He said, God... There's this king out here, and God says, you can go tell Hezekiah, go home and go to bed. Everything's fine. And that night, God sent the death angel down into the camp of Sennacherib. I believe that was Michael. And he went down into the camp of Sennacherib and went to the camp and killed 185,000 men in one night. And that next morning, Sennacherib rose up and went, my armies are dead. And he took off running back to his home in Assyria. They tried to come down, but God wasn't ready to take Israel till five, southern Judah until 586 B.C. So God delivers southern Judah from the greatest army in the world. 
When they came in to take northern Israel, they came down and tried to take southern Judah, but that didn't work because they weren't unrighteous yet. But where they where where the southern Judah comes to the peak is in this twenty first chapter of Second Kings. This God says, "Here's the icing on the cake. This is the cherry on the top of the icing." You can put that at the in the margin of your twenty first chapter of Second Kings. Cherry on the icing. This is on the top of the cake. God says, this is it. I am fed up with you because of what happens here. Look here. 21. Now we know that when you get on up here into the 25th chapter, just four chapters later, here's the man that's coming to the throne. Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah. Hezekiah is one of the most righteous men that ever lived in Israel. Manasseh, his son is one of the most wicked kings that ever. He was the most wicked king that ever existed. And oh yes, by the way, he was one of God's elect. Now, when you look at Manasseh here, you can see the capability of a believer. Is a believer capable of murder and adultery? Well, David committed murder and adultery, didn't he? Yep. People say, you don't know how bad I am. Say, I can't come to Grace and Truth Ministries. He says, I'm real bad. Will you ever read the Psalms? Oh, yeah, I like the Psalms. Well, do you know that David, the psalmist, committed murder and adultery with Bathsheba and then had her husband killed in the midst in the heat of the battle? How much worse is that? And Uriah the Hittite was one of David's finest soldiers, one of his most faithful soldiers. When David called him in out of the battle after he got Bathsheba pregnant, he said, you need to go home to your wife and sleep with her and have the comfort of a home at a home tonight. And David's thinking, maybe if I can get him to sleep with his wife, when that baby's born and looks like me, maybe nobody will notice. Yeah. And the next morning, David got up and came out to the steps of the palace. And guess who's sleeping on the doorsteps? Uriah the Hittite. He says, how can I go and enjoy my wife at home and family when my king is in battle with the Ammonites? David, oh God, what am I going to do there? I know. I'll write a note here. I want you to take this to your commander. You know, my nephew, Joab, you're right. Take it up there in the heat of battle. And, and you take this and you be faithful. Don't you look at it. He takes it to Joab, David's commanding general, his captain of the host. Joab, his nephew, opens it. Now, Joab was a murderer. He didn't think nothing about killing anybody. As David's nephew. He looks at it and says, Put Uriah the Hittite in the heat of the battle. Withdraw from him so he'll be killed. Thank you, Uncle David. <laughs> you think that... You think you're too evil? Have you ever done anything like that? Take one of your most faithful friends, got their wife pregnant, and then had them murdered? David did. And then he said, he cried out and said, God, I only have sinned against you. And, God, and David repented. And David was a man after God's own heart. He was actually called, even after all this, one of the righteous kings of Israel. David... Hezekiah, Josiah, the only totally righteous kings of Israel that followed God with all their heart. Now, the most unrighteous king was a king of Judah. He was a descendant of Judah. He was an ancestor of Jesus through his stepfather, Joseph. Manasseh. Don't confuse him with Manasseh, the firstborn son. Manasseh was a common name in the ancient world. Don't confuse him with the firstborn son of Joseph. Now, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hephzibah. Now, if he was 12 years old, the reason they said his mother's name was Hephzibah, they would have a queen mother. The queen mother would listen to the, the authorities and the couriers that would come in and say, Son, this is what they're saying, and this is what you need to tell them. She was more or less ruling for him until he got to an age where he could make decisions. So Hephzibah probably wasn't a very good mother, if you want to know why he did the things he did. 
And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abomination of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. He built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. His father Hezekiah had destroyed all this. This was a super godly righteous man. One of the most wonderful men. Hezekiah would be a great guy to talk to when we get to heaven. And what would you think when all that big army came outside of Jerusalem, Hezekiah? I was scared to death. And Isaiah went and talked to the Lord, just a few words, and God says, everything's taken care of. Why would you need a man king when you could have God to be a king that could have Michael the archangel come down and kill people and send earthquakes and send lightning bolts? I mean, I'd rather have that in bows and arrows, wouldn't you? And he built up again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed, and he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove after all of this has been wiped out. And, and as did Ahab, king of Israel, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them, and he built altars in the house of of the Lord, not altars for God, altars for Baal in the temple. Good grief, Manasseh. What is wrong with you? You know? And he's one of God's elect. And I thought when I read first read this chapter when I was about 21 or whenever it was, I thought, God, you need to put that man in hell. He deserves to go to hell. But I read Second Chronicles I found out he repented after he was carried off to Babylon. Just shows you how bad believers can live. Now this is all of this is why God scattered Israel. Now we're going to get to we're going to get to first Kings or Second Kings. Got too many eyes there. Second Kings, we're going to look at Chapter 17, where northern Israel, Israel scattered in 722 B.C. They were fighting them since the 15th chapter, which was around 732 B.C. Second Kings 15. And we're going to look at 18 and 19 where the Assyrians come down to southern Judah and they, they say we're going to destroy southern Judah along with it. And God says, no, you're not. Then we're going to look at 2 Kings, the 25th chapter, 2 Kings 25. Now this is northern Israel here, northern Israel being scattered. We'll look at 2 Kings 25 and 2 Chronicles 36, and this is where, this is where southern Judah is scattered and carried away. And that, on all this ended May 1948, May 14, 1948. All this that happened here, and we're going to look at, uh, at Jeremiah Jeremiah the thirty second chapter, this is where this is where the same thing is happening. Jeremiah thirty two is where northern Israel or southern Judah is scattered. Now Jeremiah was the last prophet of Israel. He prophesied for forty years from about uh six twenty five twenty six B.C. until 586 B.C. And that was the end. And all of the book of Jeremiah takes place during this time period here. And that's also the same time period, the same thing that's happening here in 2 Kings. In fact, in 2 Kings, through the last, through these last kings of Israel down here, Jeremiah's prophesying in Israel. Now, where was I? How much time do I have, Mike? All right. I was going to try to get to these chapters, but we'll get to these chapters next week, okay? Now, 
I want you to see, like I said, the icing on the cake. God says, I've had my fill with Manasseh. So, where was I? Verse 4. He built altars in the house of the Lord. He built altars for Baal, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name, not Baal's name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Good night, man. Now, I don't know whether he built them out. I believe he set some up in here. Some say he raised up these deities inside the temple. I don't know whether he put any inside here where the Ark of the Covenant was. I don't know if maybe God had killed him. But let's read on here. But he put them up in the house of God, in the courts of God's house. He built, and he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two, court, two courts of the house of the Lord. He made his son to pass through the fire to observe times, use enchantments, and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image of the grove the upright goddess, the tree goddess, the Christmas tree, that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem which I have chosen, out of the tribes of Israel will I put my name forever. Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I gave their fathers, only if they will observe to do I will not take them out only if they observe to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they hearkened not and Manasseh seduced them. Read, look at, pay attention to verse 9. Highlight this in great big red letters. But Manasseh, they hearkened not and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel when they were coming into Israel. Israel did more evil than anybody under Manasseh. Whew, that's pretty serious, isn't it? And the Lord spake by his servants, the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh the king of Judah hath done these abominations and hath done wickedly, above all the Amorites. Amorite was a term used for all the pagan tribes of Canaan when Israel came in there. The Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Hittites, the, all of the ites. He said they're doing worse than all these people. And hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am through with Israel. I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever heareth it, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. This is God's final words. He said, Manasseh has done the... He said, this, you got on my last nerve, boy. I am through. We got the most righteous king that ever walked after the law of God, God, which is going to be his grandson. But God says, nevertheless, because Josiah comes along and destroys everything in Israel, we've done that before, and you didn't listen. So his grandson... Manasseh's grandson, his son is Ammon, he's evil, and Josiah is going to be the most righteous king that ever walked after the Lord's law with all his heart. Hezekiah is the most righteous king that ever walked after God in faith. And here's, here's Hezekiah and his great-great-grandson Josiah, and right in between is two wicked kings and the son of Hezekiah, the most wicked king that lived. And because of the things that Manasseh did, God says, this is it. My patience is up. I'm going to wipe Jerusalem. I'm going to turn it upside down when I bring Nebuchadnezzar in. And God's going to bring Nebuchadnezzar in. God said, I'll do it. And they're going to come in murdering and slaughtering. And God says, that's me. God says, I will not pity. 
I'm going to have the women's bellies ripped open that are carrying babies in their bellies. You had no pity for me. I have none for you. And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance to deliver them into the hand of their enemies for 2,600 years. Let me put that in there. And they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day that their fathers came forth out of Egypt. Ever since they came out of Egypt, they have been provoking me to anger, not listening to me. That's why he's called us a new Israel. I'm called my people by another name, Gentile church, spiritual Israel. Even unto this day, moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And he always ends a man's life by saying these words. The rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and he sinned, that he sinned, are they not written in the book of Chronicles and the kings of Judah? And if you want to go over there to Second Chronicles, the 33rd chapter, we'll see what he did. In Second Chronicles, the 33rd chapter. Second Chronicles. I said that First and Second Kings, you're going to find the events in Second Chronicles. Look at Second Chronicles 33. I've had people come here and say, I've asked, pe asked preachers, why did God destroy Israel? It's all over the Old Testament. Now when you read Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nam, Haggai, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, you, uh, you read all these men and they talk about Israel's apostasy and going after destroying Judah and destroying northern Israel and going after Baal in the grove and your lovers and your gods. It's not even hard to understand, is it? Old Testament's not hard. Just you have to know the history. Then he says over here in Second Chronicles, the 33rd chapter, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. Verse 1, he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem, did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abomination of the heathen. And he goes on down here. But let's go on down in the chapter. I've already read all this to you. Look at verse 9. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Israel, of Jerusalem, to err, to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria. And we see that. We see this going on throughout this book, throughout Second Kings, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And Manasseh prayed unto God. You think you can't do evil as a believer? He showed us the most evil that was ever done in Israel was by a believer. And heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. That's good, isn't it? Shows you what sin and filth God can save a man from. Now you go back over to Second Kings. Not that 21st chapter. When you get into the 22nd chapter, you see Josiah begin to reign. Josiah is reigning. By the time you get to Josiah through Manasseh and Ammon, every vestige and every resemblance of worship of Jehovah has been lost. The book of the law has been lost. And Hilkiah the high priest is in the temple and he finds the book of the law and gives it to Shaphan the scribe. And Shaphan the scribe takes the book of the law to Josiah and reads the book of the law into the ears of Josiah. And Josiah begins to weep and says, what have we done with our God? He says, we're going to have the greatest revival that Israel has ever seen. And there's Baal and Grove all over Israel. And Josiah has the greatest final revival that Israel has ever seen. He says, we're going to destroy everything in Israel that has to do with Baal and the Grove and all these sun gods. And he does that in the 23rd chapter. 
We're going to come back and cover that. But after he destroys it all, let me show you what the Bible says about Josiah. In that 23rd chapter. When you go through the whole chapter, he is defiling Topheth, the valley of the children of Hinnom, taking all the gods in the first part of the chapter, stomping them to powder. He don't want any, want any resemblance. Name your kid Josiah. That's a great name. A righteous king. You get down here into verse 24. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits. Remember that familiar spirit? is the word ob. It means bottle. It's ventriloquism. They thought they, they would pretend to be talking to the dead by throwing their voice and peeping and muttering. And the wizards and the images and the idols and the, all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord when he gave it, she gave it to Shaphan the scribe and said, Go read this to the king. Can you imagine in two generations they had completely forgotten the law of God? <laughs> Gone. I think America's completely forgotten the law of God, haven't we? 25 tells you what God says to say about Josiah. Would to God he would say these words about me. And like unto Josiah was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to the law of Moses. Neither after Josiah arose any like him. Notwithstanding, nevertheless. Remember what was said in the previous chapter? I like Jerusalem clean like the man wipes the slate, plate turning it upside down. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him with all. God says, I'm not turning back from what I promised I'd do because of what Manasseh did, regardless of how righteous Josiah is. You know why I believe he's doing that? He says, you'll clean it up, then you'll go right back to it, because they always did, didn't they? Yep. Always did. In fact, when Josiah, when Josiah dies, God says, I'm not going to let Josiah see what I'm going to do to Jerusalem not, not while he's alive. After his death, I'll do it. He was a righteous king. And Josiah was the last legitimate king of Israel. He was the last righteous king, but the last legitimate king. After his death, you've got, Josiah's got a son, Jehoahaz. Hohaz, H A Z. Hohaz. And then he's also got a son named Jehoiakim. And he's also got another son named Zedekiah. And Jehoiakim's son is Jehoiakim. Huh? Except for Jehoiakim. Yeah. These last kings here, these, Jehoahaz was the son of Josiah, and he becomes the king after Josiah. And then Jehoiakim becomes king, and he's carried off into captivity. And then Jehoiakim's son, Jehoiakim, is carried off into Babylon. And then the last king of Israel is Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim's brother, Zedekiah. And Zedekiah is a sissy. That's all I can think of him. He is a pansy. All the people come and say, Jeremiah's preaching out here and all the gates of the city. Can we kill him? He's disheartening the people. He keeps saying Nebuchadnezzar's on the way. Josiah said, well, 
I just had a guy said, well, you can put him in the mire. It just depends. A gutless, gutless king. Didn't have sense enough God gave a blind goose in a snowstorm. Just a stupid man. You can put him in the, in, in the mire, and the mire was said to be human waste in the dungeons. That was their septic systems, some of the writers say. Okay, and that's why I had that Michael Pinion paint that picture of Josiah back there on the wall, Jeremiah hanging in the mire. This is where Christianity begins. Jeremiah had two friends that he knew of. Baruch, which was his stenographer that helped him write things out, and Ebedmelech was an Ethiopian eunuch. That was it. All of Israel, he did not have coliseums full of people. All of Israel wanted to kill him. All the princes wanted to kill him. Zedekiah said, you can hang him in the mire. And then the rumors would come that Nebuchadnezzar was on his way. And Zedekiah would be going, somebody go get Jeremiah out of the mire. And Jeremiah would come in and say, Jeremiah, have you heard a word from the Lord? Yes! Nebuchadnezzar's coming. Just a pansy. When we get into that 25th chapter of 2 Kings and the 36th chapter of 2 Chronicles, we see Zedekiah, the last king of Israel. They bring his sons to him. They said, in Nebuchadnezzar says, he's the commanding chief. He's the commander of Nebuchadnezzar's armies. He says, take a look at your sons. This is the last you're ever going to see of them. And he kills his sons before his very eyes. And then he says, now, I want you to take a poker and punch out Zedekiah's eyes. They do that, strip him naked, tie his hands behind their back, and march him off to Babylon. We don't hear of Zedekiah anymore. What a sad way to end your life. All because of this bell in the grove, he didn't have guts enough to stand up for God. The last righteous king, and these kings here, they went under tribute. They went under tribute to Babylon. And some of them would try to go over here to go over here to Pharaoh Necho of Egypt and try to make friends when they were when Babylon was their protector, was their protector, and all they had to do was pay tribute, and Babylon would come in and take care of all their enemies. There is no wonder that Babylon. Not only did Israel go after all this idolatry, but Babylon had every reason to come in and destroy Israel. You understand that? Because they, they, they turned on their earthly protection, not only their godly protection, and the last king that worshipped God in Israel was Josiah. And they were scattered. And we'll go through the scattering in Second. In 2 Kings, the 17th chapter, and the 25th chapter of 2 Kings, 20, 17th chapter is the scattering of, of northern Israel. 2 Kings, the 32nd chapter is the scattering of southern Judah. Uh, the 25th chapter is the scattering of southern Judah. In 2 Chronicles, the 36th chapter is the scattering of southern Judah. And then we'll go over there in Jeremiah and look how Nebuchadnezzar treats Jeremiah and says, Jeremiah, we heard you were a righteous man. King Nebuchadnezzar said, you tried to warn these people. You can come to Babylon. We'll give you houses, lands, whatever you want. Jeremiah said, I'll stay here with the poor. He said, whatever you want. Nebuchadnezzar heard you're righteous. You see, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't the bad guy in this. Israel was the bad guy. You understand that? Nebuchadnezzar was doing the will of God, and not only that, he was doing what was right as far as man was concerned, because these people were paying no attention to his protection. They had made a league with him. They had made a covenant and a contract with him. You be our protector, we'll pay you tribute. Oh, we're going to run over here to King to Pharaoh Necho. They were never faithful to anybody. You want to know why God scattered Israel, why he brought them back? This is just the beginning of the story. We're out of time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. Cause us to continue this work that we do. Help us to see what's happening in this world, that what's happening in the Middle East is what began to happen in the Old Testament with all these unrighteous kings. Make us to realize that this applies to us. When we look at Manasseh, we realize how evil we can be as believers. 
God will give you praise for everything. Lead us to your elect. Open up doors for the ministry, and we'll praise you for it all. In Christ's name, amen. amen. <coughs> oh, me. Yeah, Ken. Uh, he, he was the pansy. Was it his daddy or was it him? He reigned in Babylon. Yeah. He went over the He was kind of set up like a king. Sure. 
They don't know why Israel is scattered. They don't know if God. They don't even know that God was angry with Israel. They don't even know that. I am. I believe the Lord. I don't see how it could be anything else than He's about to. You know, uh, Mike, and, uh, Mike and Denise was in Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, Thank <laughs> you. 
But we appreciate all you guys understanding. Yeah. It's, it's a good thing you can like add us right Well, yeah. Tom and Lee, all we got. Because they were, you know, she's, she's leaning on different people. You know, trying to get them here. Yeah. What but you lost to do. That's a good thing. Because yeah. yeah. she doesn't have a Spanish. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, that's when yeah, she feels like she's, she's just, you know, because she wants to come with her, she's going to have to go to the gym. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. I'll just keep you posted. I'll keep you posted all the time. Okay. 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 So it'll be the afternoon. I'm not going to say February. February, next one, next one. Okay. Well, yeah, keep me posted. I'll forget. Okay. I'll keep on reminding you because I still have to have a time. Okay. And it's definitely going to be Saturday and Sunday. Okay. Well, you're not going to be here. Whatever you want. Do you want to bring something? Saturday. Saturday. So it'll just be for the hour. Uh, I forgot where you live. Can you go to the park? You get out of here. Turn on the carriage. Make a right. Uh -huh. It's a little light. Make a left. Uh -huh. So when you make the left, to the right side. Okay. And then you pass Citadel. And then it says, only turn right. Uh -huh. And you turn that right. That's the anchor. Fire, 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 fire. Yeah. Don't go out. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, 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 all right. I'll see you. Oh, uh, Ricky wants to come back Friday. 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 Ricky wants to come back Friday.
Yeah, I'll, we'll, we'll send an email. So, uh, Summer, mm -hmm. where to? Oh, Jason got tired of waiting, so I guess we're 